So I made the mistake, I made the mistake this morning of uh, deciding that I was going to write, uh, modify my set of slides very substantially, uh, which was, uh, will produce almost a new slide deck, which is why, why I was frantically uh, working on it just now. And so I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to talk to you about where we are and uh, where we're going uh, in, terms of, in terms of open data. And just to, to mention some things, one, I mean, you could say something about the Open, Open Knowledge Foundation in a moment, but I'm also, I should say, I'm a Shutterworth Foundation fellow. Uh, for those of you who know Ubuntu, uh, Mr. Shutterworth is uh, one of these generous men. He, he has a foundation which funds uh, about 10 fellows a year, and it's absolutely amazing. And I do recommend anyone who's interested in data and changing the world and open stuff to, to apply to them. Um, it's, very, it's, yeah, it's a very unusual fellowship as well, and that you get about uh, you can possibly get about half a million, or about half a million pounds in project funding from them. So just to say, I start off, just for those of you who don't know, um, the Open Knowledge Foundation is a community-based non-for-profit that was founded eight years ago now, in 2004. Uh, and it now has activities as projects and partnerships around the world, and is especially active in Europe. Um, it now has, there's about a dozen uh, either active or incubating chapters in particular countries. There's about 15 working groups on transport, geodata, legislation, humanities. Uh, so if you're interested, you know, if, if this computer science stuff is, is not doing it for you and you really like Shakespeare or Goethe or Machado de Assis, there's, there's stuff there for you. And what the foundation does is we build tools, communities, and applications to create, use, and share open data and knowledge. That's content and data that everyone and anyone can use, share, and build on. Um, and we do that, we do that in the belief that by, by opening up information and by applying it to pressing social research and uh, innovation issues, we can make a significant impact and improvement on the world. Um, that nowadays I think this will all take it for granted, but you know, data and information are often at the center of addressing everything from sometimes the trivial or, or the significant, depending on your life, you know, how you get to work most efficiently to climate change, to how we engage and run our engage with our government and run our countries. So one thing I just want to say is just a quick thing, quick advertisement here at the beginning, uh, is if, if you're enjoying this, uh, or if you're interested in open data and open knowledge, um, come to the Open Knowledge Festival uh, in Helsinki, which is in Finland this year. Uh, we've been running, it's, it's a combination of two events, which some of you may have attended, OGD Camp, Open Government Data Camp, uh, the longest now, it's the, in its third year, and uh, one of the largest open government data events, and OKCOM, the Open Knowledge Conference, which we've run since 2005, uh, believe it or not. And so this will be a week-long extravaganza. And for those of you who came to Berlin last year, it was about 500 people. Uh, it's, it's really fun, it's really interesting, uh, and I think it, often one of the most productive events, people, you you know, from, you'll have everyone from policy, policy makers to, to civic hackers um, there. You'll have everyone from artists uh, to anthropologists. So come along to Helsinki uh, in, in September. I want to start uh, with two stories um, from this. Um, the first story actually is really is from 2008, um, it, and it was uh, it, it's, it's a traffic data odyssey. You can find if you want to read this, uh, you can read along on uh, blog.okfn.org. That's that's the link. And um, basically, uh, I I was quite interested in traffic. So you know, going back to issues, uh, someone had been I've been talking with a researcher at University of Cambridge, University of Cambridge, who was telling me that he'd done he'd been looking at traffic patterns and. His estimate was that 25% of people's time, uh, basically on the M25, which is a very big road which goes around London, it's true of many cities now, they have a circular road around them, um, about a quarter of people's time was wasted compared to the optimum. If everyone could travel uh, around the M25 without hitting traffic jams or having other stuff, they would save a quarter of the time spent traveling on the M25, which is a huge amount of hours. A lot of people commute around it. So it's a really large amount of time. Um, I don't know if, also if you know, but one of the things, that I, I was an economist, and one of the things I uh, was, was interested in was actually happiness research, uh, well-being research. And uh, if you go and, if you go and, um, 
if you go and survey people, or it's, it's not even quite surveying, you, it's kind of real-time data you get on people where they tell you how happy they are. The thing that comes bottom of the list uh, for contentment and well-being is, is, is commuting to work, um, in fact. So <laughs> this, one, this is not only just a time-saving, but it's also a kind of making people happier. So I sat there and I thought, wow, you know, I, I would be interested in having access to this data. I'm, you know, I may not be a transport scientist, but I am, uh, in fact, an academic at the time. I'm a researcher. And um, the thing you, you want to see here is um, I, knew, I knew that count data was available. I'd, I'd been told this. So I, I wrote to them. I said, I request a request for count data collected by UQA departments for transport in the form of MIDAS, which stands for Motorway Incident Detection Automatic Signaling. And what's kind of interesting is you can find this on the web. You go to this website, or at least at the time, I think it's changed now, I'll come to that. You went to this website, and um, there was a kind of almost blank page which said, um, you know, click here for more. And we clicked here, it said, well, you need, you need a password to access access this data set, please email this person, um, which was actually, uh, actually the company um, that ran this for the Department of Transport. So I, I, I wrote to them, I said, I'm a UK citizen interested in getting access to the traffic count data and logs data set uh, linked from this site. And so what this is, by the way, is it's a data set that says it, they do a survey basically once a year where they record on major roads how many cars pass given points. So it's a very detailed data set of traffic flow, essentially, and volume around the UK. UK. Um, and I said, it appears that a username and password is required from yourselves in order to do this. And so I wondered if you could therefore be kind enough to provide me with such a username and password. Um, and this was, this was about, I think, in October and November. And uh, that began a series of email correspondence uh, that went on for a while. And around mid-December, I finally got this response from the relevant, uh, the relevant official. And I'm, don't, you don't need to read all of this. It's the, it's the highlighted bits. I think, I need your acceptance of the conditions stated below and some information regarding research project you're undertaking before we allow you access to the data. Um, this is done to justify various things. I mean, I did wonder what costs exactly were involved um, since they already had a BZIP file available on the website. I knew that um, was the case. Um, and to assure the data, this is what I love, was the data was being assured, being used appropriately. And it gets better. If you go down, and I particularly want to highlight an item, just jump down to item four of the conditions. I mean, I think this should be enshrined. Um, the data will not be used to contradict or challenge any research project, works or state statement made by the government, the Department of Transport, or the highways agency as a result of an analysis of the data by them or their agents. So we'll give you this data, but you shouldn't use it to do research that would call into question government policy. That would be bad. Um, I mean, it's a pretty stark statement um, there. Now, the other point was obviously number three, the data must not be sold or used for commercial gain. I found this intriguing. It wasn't like the Department of Transport was selling this data, by the way. You couldn't buy it from it. It wasn't like they had a revenue stream um, from this data. They just probably didn't, they just didn't want you doing this. They didn't want companies making a buck um, out of this money. Um, and I love what also, just imagine you were doing this. The conditions, you have to say, if the project is, I mean, other things you have to say, by the way, um, you have to tell them exactly, if you look at item two, you had to tell them exactly what research project you were doing. Though, you know, for those of you who do research, I mean, obviously some people's research programs are very defined. They know exactly the problem they do, but some of the best research programs, as we know, famously, you know, Palestine, things happen unexpectedly. Uh, it's good for researchers to have access to information so they can poke around in it and see if it, you know, see if they can find things they weren't anticipating. Um, but you needed to tell them that. And you also need to ensure that all grant and contract holders, staff and students associated with the grant and project were made aware of these conditions. So every single person you came into contact with or worked on your project, you'd need to make sure they were aware of this. You'd probably get in trouble, remember, if they suddenly went and leaked the data on the web. Um, you know, and so on. So this was, this was uh, uh, and sadly so about, and, and remember also, this took me three months. Uh, by the time I got to this point, it was three months after my initial request, finally in mid-January uh, 2008, that I gave up and said, okay, fine, uh, I think this is ludicrous, but um, you know, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to agree to these conditions. Um, which, you know, again, if you're a company, 
you know, you're trying to innovate, you might say, well, I'm interested in this data set, there might be something I could build with it, you know I mean? I don't know, I'm trying to design a system that makes it more efficient to route lorries to deliver things in Britain by using a data set on when road congestion is. You know, who knows what I'm doing? And I might be just trying to experiment. I might want to get this data for one of my developers for two or three days for them to play around and see if it's useful. It probably won't be useful, I'll not use it, but I would like to just try it out. And at this point, three months in, uh, you know, and like X hours in my case, time later, you'd have probably given given up. So this kind of comes, this story was, you know, open data. So why, why was this a big deal? You know, if this had just been open data, it would have been accessible, it would have been licensed, I could have reused it. And by the way, I think, I believe, this was one of the first data sets released under data.gov.uk, at least a portion of this. So it's kind of got a nice story, which is uh, a year and a half later, this was one of the data sets that the, the, the far-seeing civil servants launching data.gov.uk persuaded people to give them. Um, so Midas, it had a, it had a happy end the Midas story, uh, unlike the true story of Midas, of course. Um, so, but this is why my point. So, this is why open data mattered to, to me and to other people. Is that I want it? I want the data. I, you know, I want the data raw, and I want it now. Um, and I want to be able to use it commercially. I want to be able to give it to other people without having to worry about what conditions. And so it brings me then to a second story. Uh, so, well, so sorry, just to emphasize that as your point. So. Oh, and open data, it's, it's important to say a little bit more detail uh, about what open data means. Because often, for example, uh, that non-commercial restriction, people out there think, oh, well, it's on the web, you can use it. Uh, it hasn't maybe got a license on it, um, and you shouldn't use it commercially, but oh, it's open data, it's public for people to use. No, that isn't open data. Um, it really matters, and I'm gonna come back to why this is later, but the simplest reason it matters so much to have a definition and to really care about what we mean about open data is interoperability. You know, we want to share and we want to integrate. And if we want to integrate, then we need uh, data to be under open, to mean a standard, to mean something that's compatible. Um, and so I've really emphasized, for example, um, I don't know how many times I now see this, sadly, um, but it's people saying, my stuff is Creative Commons, or, you know, wouldn't we only just license stuff under Creative Commons? And even more worrying to me, even really worrying to me, is I start seeing it written into grant um, making agreements from public bodies, from research funding bodies, from in large institutions, they'll say things like, your software must be open source and your content, and sadly not yet enough, data must be Creative Commons. And of course, for those of us who know, Creative Commons is not a commons. Its set of licenses are mutually incompatible. In fact, the most widely used like most well-known project using probably Creative Commons in the world is now Wikipedia, and the most widely used Creative Commons license by, by usage is incompatible with Wikipedia. It is a non-commercial license, the non-commercial flavor of Creative Commons, and they're not compatible. So it really is important to say this, not because I think Creative Commons in many ways is absolutely fantastic, I worked for them for a while, but I'm really worried that the term Commons in their name is fundamentally misleading people and that it really concerns me when it starts getting written in as a kind of standard into grant agreements. It's crucial that if we're gonna do that, and I think it's a really useful thing to do, that we use a proper standard. And that's what the open definition is. A bunch of, you can go there and it lists exactly which Creative Commons licenses are open in the sense of being conformant, and it also explains why this idea. And in summary, it is this sense, a piece of content or data is open if anyone is free to use, reuse, and redistribute it, subject only at most the requirements to attribute and share alike. And so anyone means anyone. Uh, and again, by the way, this is very much borrowed. The open definition is essentially the open source definition, but for data and content. Okay, um, so another story, so kind of just to emphasize, so one, one thing that you'll note, that summary is a little bit misleading for a reason you'll see in a moment. Open data is a bit more than just a licensing. Uh, the open definition requires a bit more for your stuff to be open data. And that brings me to this then. So this, is, this was story two. Uh, and again, this actually, back in the day, before CCAN existed and the Data Hub existed, uh, I did a project called Open Economics, which went around uh, trying to get data sets together and kind of view them in a, in a standard format in a way that you could share. And this was, um, I brought it up to date now today, but this was one of the data sets I came across. And this is from, you know, in many ways this is good, right? This was not PDF. I was grateful when I found this file. It's from uh, the US uh, Bureau of Labor, uh, um, Bureau, yeah, Bureau of Labor and Statistics, BL, BLS. So it's basically 
The Statistics Department of the Bureau of Labor in the US, which you know, deals with unemployment, employment, and all you know, social security, low social security stuff. And this was their data set on unemployment. This was their number one, when I found it, link to a raw data on, on unemployment. And who here, uh, most of you here are possibly programmers. So you may be aware that this is human readable. But parsing this file to identify columns, I mean, do you notice the way that in plain text they've done the equivalent of, of cell merge at the top there with employed is actually a group over three other columns? Um, you know, it's really, really awesome stuff. I mean, in fact, this is getting on for AI style parsing to do something to parse this um, out of plain text because all the columns are a bit weird. They don't even actually, they sometimes even overlap a bit. Um, this is really, really uh, non trivial. In fact, I gave up on trying to extract the columns and just type them out by hand. Um, and this was, this was the code um, I wrote. So at the time, you know, things like Scraper Wiki uh, or whatever I like, you know, I wrote, so I wrote, I wrote some code which I fixed up this morning. It still worked five years on. I was very pleased with myself. Um, but here I had, I had to write code. I had to spend a while technically writing stuff to extract it so that I could get this. So at the end of it, I had it in a nice CSV file and I could load it into Recline, in this case, the Recline Data Explorer, and I could tell a story. So the reason, to come back also, the two stories in this, I've told you two stories. We always begin with a problem. We begin with some end. We begin with a question. You know, how much time and how much happier could we be as a society if people spent less time on the M25? Or what has gone on with unemployment in the United States? Um, and one of the things you could see is that that's basically the end of, end of uh, the end of the 30s at the beginning there. That's the beginning of the Second World War. Second World War, you know, fighting wars is always really good for full employment policies. Um, in general, by the way, it's a tip. Uh, it's bad for inflation, but often good, good for full employment. Um, and that was the kind of, e even at the end of the 40s, by the way, the US, even though the Great Depression is early 30s, still at the end of the 1930s, the US was still in a very bad way um, and had 10% unemployment. You can see during that period, the great golden era up to the early 70s, the oil shock, Vietnam, um, etc. You can see the story, of course, the early 80s, um, burned out buildings in New York, unemployment back nearly at a 50-year high. And you can see how close we've got back there. Um, uh, you know, we, again, it was back to pretty great good times. 5% is around that area that economists think is the natural kind of rate of unemployment in economy. I mean, you can get it a little bit lower, maybe. Um, and now we're back up there, so you can see the effect of, of, of the Great Depression version, too. Um, so you can tell the story, you can see something. But I had to spend time with a computer machine doing this. Yeah, so, and you know, to give one other example of, of this kind of stuff, um, Open Spending is another project the OKF do, uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation do, which is our dream is to map spending uh, from, the, from, from, the, from, from, from a community up, from, from a community-based project, uh, similar to OpenStreetMap, but for money, to map spending uh, and public finance worldwide. Um, and as you can see, we're now, we were at two countries about a year ago, we're now up to about 25, and I think there's actually been two more out in the last week. But the story here was about the UK government. The UK government, again, know a lot about them, having uh, worked with Nigel and others there. The UK government did something amazing. They said, okay, we're going to publish not only general high-level spending information like this. This is the kind of, uh, this is part of, part of open spending. This is where does my money go. This is very high-level. Uh, if you go to wheredoesmymoneygo.org and you play around with this visualization, you can only get down to levels around, if you're lucky, 100 million pounds, but normally a billion large numbers at very high aggregate level. And that's interesting. It's interesting if you're a policymaker. It's not so interesting if you're a citizen. If you're an average person, and even if we're not an average person, you're probably interested in what goes on on your street, what goes on in your city. Not that we spent 1.5 billion last year on X. It's just such a big number. Um, and so one of the things the UK government does, I think is what makes them one of, I mean, I think practically almost at the moment only in the world, is they publish transactional level spending. They publish spending by department monthly at a very, very detaggregated level, i.e. literally the purchases that department has made that month. You know, we paid Vodafone 300 pounds last month for mobile phone provision. Um, and they do it at the local government level as well. The story about this was the government did something also really amazing. They said, you're gonna, we wrote a specification. It was a PDF document, unfortunately, but it was a PDF document for HMT. And it said, you will have a CSV file, and it will have 12 columns. 
right? And these, these are the columns you will have. And one of the things we wanted to do was an open spending, and you can go there and see it at the moment. If you go there and you look at the department's data set, you'll see like two million transactions that we've aggregated. But in doing that, we had to get all this data together from data.gov.uk. Um, in fact, about, at the moment, it's about 2,000 separate CSV files that we harvest and bring together. And of those, 20% don't comply with the standard in some way or other, right? With a 12-column CSV, they either, by to be honest, to be honest, when I say don't comply, about three quarters of those files simply, even though they're listed on data.gov UK, do not actually resolve, they, they, I mean, they 404, they do not resolve to an actual file. Someone's moved it, they got the URL wrong, whatever it is, right? But the other 5%, people, you know, I mean, we've seen incredible stuff. We've seen file, Excel files that were, I don't know, somehow got included in some way. We've seen things that aren't even Excel, CSV, or any file format where you can work out what they are. The other very common thing um, is just date formats. People put out, I mean, you you would not believe the ways that you can specify date formats. Um, but the most obvious is obviously uh, doing US versus UK time formats, you know, I don't know, messing it up in various ways. And I think we should remember this. When we get very excited about our schema, I spoke to a guy the other day from Hampshire County Council in the UK, and he had, he had been drinking the linked data Kool-Aid. I mean, he was sold, right? He was like, man, all this linking, it's gonna be amazing. I said, well, okay, why don't we just get your spending? You have this spending data, you publish it on your website, 500 pounds spending. Let's just get it right now, and um, I, might, I might actually do, be as crazy here as to try and do a live demo. Uh, do I have Hampshire County Council suppliers? Um, I do, and I'm gonna go to the data so I said, why don't we load it into the data hub um, here? And, um, and, 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 and I said, you know, ah, oh, it's really sad because I was going to try and plot your spending by time, I said to him. And, uh, you know, sadly, okay, I mean, it's our fault maybe. Our computer's not very intelligent. And, um, I mean, I won't go into the detail, but I'll, let me, I mean, maybe I'll show you. Live demos are great, aren't they? Um, if you look here at date, um, uh, worked out that it's, it thinks it's a string rather than a date time. So the, just to say, a data hub behind the scenes, it gets the CSV, it tries to work out what the columns are, it tries to tell you that they're dates because that allows you to do, present the data well. Why? I said to him, boy, why is that? It's because you use dot separators, and it's not trivial for a computer. But I can look at that and go, God, it's called posting date, and it looks awful like a date. That is a date column. But computers have a lot of trouble doing that. And they, if you, you know, they go wrong, like it might turn out actually this was something else, or this was, you know, I, if you're aware that many countries in the world use dots as comma separators in long numbers. And he was like, no one had told us that before. Wow, that's like one of the most useful things. I've and like, this is the level sometimes we're at. You know, we're not like linking this magically together with some other data set. It's people giving out you know, standardized format stuff with, with, with the dates, not with dashes rather than, you know, with dots rather than dashes, and that messing up our systems. Um, so, you know, just, it's, it's a point there. So, you know, the point I'd say here is 20% of the files did not validate. 20% of the data could not be imported. And that's then coming to the question of have people got things wrong if they transposed it. But coming back to that story, the story of the US employment and of open spending was machine readability. So open spending it was still a lot better. Some of the files didn't comply, but I did not have to go and write special scrapers or special parsers to take human readable text files and turn them into to something, uh, something that a machine could make. So machine readability is really important. And in fact, actually, if you go and read the open definition, it says that machine readability is part of it. And it says that bulk data is part of it. It says that for data to be open data, it must be openly licensed, and it must be arrayed available in bulk and machine readable. So I think, for example, APIs are amazing. In fact, APIs may be the thing, you know, for some many developers, you most want. But the point is, many people can build APIs. I mean, it's, it's, it, and also APIs are complicated. APIs cost money to run, right? They're a service. People should pay normally for APIs, at least high performance, reliable, SLA'd APIs are something you pay for. They're not free. You know, if I were going around saying, you've got, to, you've got to run APIs for all your data for free as part of doing open data, I think that would be a really problematic thing to be saying because it would involve a lot of cost, and governments are worried about cost, rightly, and specifically right now. And so the point here is you must make data available, machine readable, and in bulk, because it lets A, it's cheap, and B, it lets other people build things. I cannot build an API probably off your API, or I have to spend my time scraping it. 
Now I can get into we can get into the details of complicate. You know, what about real time data? What about data that's updated very frequently? Blah 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 blah. We can come to those things, but they're not that hard. And the big thing is, you should make data available in bulk. And the other thing it kind of brought me to is, one of the things was going back to that story, well, it was 2006, 2007, I did the, the unemployment data. And so we're seeing it going, well, we need better tools. We need better processes for this. That does not cut it at the moment. And obviously, one thing I just mentioned is you know, we've been working. And what, you know, why did we work on CCAN? Um, and I should emphasize this. We didn't just work on CCAN because we thought data catalogs are cool. In fact, we didn't even build CCAN to do a data catalog strictly. We built it because we wanted to automate processing of data in simple ways. We had this dream of the experience. Who here has ever used uh, a package manager on like Ubuntu or Debian or even Darwin ports? Do people know what I mean? They're these magical things, if you're a programmer, where you type some command or even just say some instruction, and magically some piece of software that may depend on dozens of other pieces of software get installed onto your machine and work normally. Right? They work. Now in data, we never do that. In data, we download Excel files, we copy columns across, we delete white space, we faff around, we turn dots into dashes. Um, that is what we spend our time doing. And the dream, and the dream that's still alive for me, though it's taking longer to realize, the dream of CCAM was could we do that kind of package management for data? That's where it began. But it also for me now, it's about automating some of the most basic processes, automating publishing, or at least making it a lot easier. If it's hard for governments to publish, if it's hard for NGOs to publish, if it's hard for research departments to publish data, then they're not going to do it. So it's about making that step really easy. It's about building in that feedback loop. So for example, on CCAN, it's a very minor thing, but on CCAN now, if you try to add a URL in the background while you're typing in, you're adding a URL to a data file, if that data file is not there, if it 404s, it will tell you then and there. It will tell you in the interface before you're allowed to save the file, are you really sure you want to save this URL as a data file because it doesn't seem to exist on the web? Right? So that kind of, that's the other thing. It's about us trying to provide those, that guidance and those prompts to people who are publishing data. You know, we can't just go out to everyone and go, you've got to do X, like, or you should put it in this format. We've got to make it really easy for people. We've got to make it part of their workflow. So my other dream, my dream which is also close to realizing, is that every time a UK civil servant publishes a file of financial data on DataGov UK, they'll have the same thing. Not only will it check the URL, but it'll check the file. It will get, grab the CSV free file, it will look at the first 10 rows, and it'll say, this looks good, or this looks bad. It will give them that feedback right then and there. I mean, the second best that, by the way, is a leaderboard, just to publish, which we can do, the stats of this department is number one on compliance with this format. This department is number 35. Only 10% of their files worked. It's surprisingly motivating, that kind of thing. And that kind of scheme of validation, either in process or out, is essential. So, you know, and CCAN, you know, we're, you know, there are loads of other things, but, you know, we're really, you know, the exciting thing is I think it's now around the world we're seeing it being able to be used very cheaply and easily for people to do this. And I even sit here, this is the other thing. The thing in these guys actually is a nice example. Uh, Brazilian government, this is their data portal, they took CCAN. And one of the things that even just innovation, they were like, okay, we had it already, but really make it prominent how much stuff is downloaded. That's the other, humans love a bit of gamification. They love leaderboards. We should do that more. I mean, I know one great thing I think, I hope I write, I saw it at Derry recently, it was like the most used ontologies, this kind of stuff. But that thing, we, we should be doing that more. Um, and you know, one of the things we've been now running for a long time is obviously the data hub. That was the other thing, making it easy for individuals or communities, anyone. You didn't need to put up CCAN, you didn't need to build a data hub or data catalog of your own. You could just go there and publish your data right now. And Recline, which you've seen a few screenshots of. Again, we need, this is pure HTML, JavaScript, make it very easy to view and visualize. People want, need something, they need some eye candy, I put it in the most extreme version. They need something at the result of what they've done. People love it to be able to see a preview, visualize their data a bit. Recline just. And things like Scraper Wiki. So this is the other thing, these tools. So going back to the story I'm saying is, the story of US unemployment data was how bad stuff was in some way. We needed better tools, we needed better processes Around, around this stuff. So, time and tide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, so I think what we've seen, you know, in some sense our story is of, of where we were um, and where are we today? 
So both of those things were now four or five years ago. How have we, we've come along? Um, and one of the things I just showed you was some of the tools that we've been, we've built, other people have built, um, you know, the linked data community have been building some awesome tools. We have been seeing evolution. And the other thing I think we've seen is a huge policy change. Um, when the Open Knowledge Foundation started in 2004 and when we wrote the open definition in 2005, um, you know, open data was not a familiar term. Um, uh, it was not one that was widely used. It was not one people were familiar with. It was certainly not something policymakers cared about in any way uh, most of the time. Not to say that there hadn't always been visionaries, let me emphasize. Uh, I had a really fantastic meeting with a, a gentleman um, who's still doing public PSI in the UK, who had advised Margaret Thatcher in 1979. He'd gone out to Silicon Valley, he'd seen an Apple Mac, one of the early Macs. Wow, okay. Um, and huge growth in the, okay, so, and he was like, okay, uh, we should be doing open data. And that was 1980, so it's taken us a while to get there. So it's huge growth. So there's data catalogs around the world. Um, you know, there were basically almost none on this map uh, three or four years ago, and now you can see it crowded. Um, we see the Open Government Partnership in Brazil. Uh, I took this photo somewhat in the dark at the end of the event. Um, a few uh, back in, in, in April, 1,400 uh, people, uh, 50 countries, whole number of them signing up saying, we love open government, we love open data, we're going to open stuff up. Um, we're seeing the community maturing. OpenStreetMap, founded in 2004, eight years on, has immense coverage, and Foursquare, this year, 29th of February, they switched to OpenStreetMap data. A major commercial company went open data. Uh, it's a really big deal. So where next? So having said that, I think we are seeing really great sign-on, but I think we're seeing a little bit sometimes, I, I've been, you know, if you review action plans from government as opposed to part of the Open Government Partnership, there's a question of toy versus core data sets. It's great to have um, the location of park benches in your city. I'm not knocking it. I think it's great and we can build useful, we can still build useful valuable apps. And it's important to emphasize that a lot of the value of open data is that long tail. It's building maybe an app that only 30 people use, but someone can now build it in an afternoon because they have the data. Whereas if they have to spend three months requesting it, they're not going to. That is important, but at the same time, those data sets are often going to be of limited value if we don't have core data sets to integrate them with, if we don't have geodata, if we don't have a national map, if we don't have transport, we need those core data sets. And so one thing, by the way, I can pitch out to you guys is we've been trying to run an open, an open data census over the last uh, month. Um, and we're trying to get as much coverage for people in the world. And the aim is to be very focused. It's on 10 data sets. We're going to expand it to more, but there are 10 top data sets we, we thought were like, after some uh, discussion on the open government uh, mailing list, these were the ones, election results, company register, national map, et cetera. These were the top 10. And we were going to look at each country in the world. It's a yes or no answer. That's what's also good about it. it you know, and it's easier than have you implemented the PSI directive provision X in this way. This is just have you done it or have you not? Um, and you c what we really want is people to help fill this in for different countries. We now have close to 140, actually, uh, responses. And we can have a leaderboard. And you can see how the UK is doing. Uh, and you can go and look it up if you're interested. Um, and so, I, I mean, going back, the other thing, where are we going? Machine readability. We want, you know, I, I've already gone on about that, so I'm not going to say so much more. The other thing is education of skills. So I think uh, uh, there's all of these stats about we're not going to have enough people, we don't have, we don't have enough education both in school, but we also are going to be short of the skilled for labor force to actually use the big data that's coming online. And so, you know, one project we've been doing with P2PU and some other partners now is called School of Data. Uh, it's, just, it's just gone live thanks to funding from Shuttleworth Foundation and the Open Society Foundation. Um, and it, again, the aim of this project, by the way, is anyone can get involved. We'd love to have a linked data component of this. Um, so I think education skills is going to be a big thing that we have done very little of, you know, getting that handbook, teaching people, uh, and so on. And I think the next aspect then um, is going to be scale. So those are kind of basic things we need to do, machine readability. But the biggest question that we're interested in is how do we scale? And I think this brings me back to open data, one of my favorite slides, this time without, without words. But the way we, is, we scale as human beings is we break problems up into components. That is how we deal with complexity. Um, you know, if you think the, the devices in front of you probably are the most complex artifacts mankind has ever made, these laptops. They are not understood by any one person. Hundreds of people design even the main chips that go into thousands. But that's how we work as humans. We break stuff up into components. 
And then we're doing that, we then want to weave them back together into these, we want to weave back complex data uh, artifacts, complex objects. And this is why I think open data is essential. So why is open data so central to the data economy? Because the dream of data at the data economy is scale and is integration. And without openness, without open data, that dream will ultimately, it will, it will either largely fail or it will become the preserve of the few. A few normally probably pre-existing large companies will be the ones, you know, you'll need to work with them. Just as in the case, really is the case to some extent around innovation on mobile phones or other people. You know, you do realize why does Android exist? Because Google spent $14 billion buying a patent portfolio to defend it, right? $14 billion to defend Android against, other, about, against patent lawsuits. And that we do not want to be a world where if you want to do something cool with data, you need to go and join one of the big three and have, your data, you know, have access to the relevant data sets. That is not the dream. I'm nearly done. So I think this also brings me to a point, which is a lot of talk about big data. And frankly, I'm sick of it. Um, okay? I mean, in a certain way, one is that big data has been around forever. In fact, big data was always the thing that was there. It was what always drove innovation. It was always data that was bigger. I mean, from the atomic test to social security, it was big data that always, if you liked, relative to the time that pushed the limits. What's interesting right now is that we, as small as individuals, as small enterprises, or as big enterprises, but particularly as individuals and small enterprises, have access to a relatively set of computing power that is relatively big compared to the data. 10 years ago, in some sense, the Open Knowledge Foundation couldn't have existed going on about open data because you wouldn't be able to get it on your laptop. In 1994, it cost $450,000 to have a terabyte of storage, and today it costs less than $100. And that relativeness of power and uh, uh, processing to storage and, and the capacity of data is what's happening right now. And that, in my mind, favors small data. And not to say that we don't want to get to big data, what we always want to do is integrate data together. But the way to big data goes via small data, via small pieces loosely joined. Most of the talk about big data, frankly, I hear, is like, we're some massive vendor, and we, want, you know, we are able to deal with petabytes of stuff in our massive uh, centralized storage silo and, and process it all for you. We can bring it all together. And I don't, at least for, the, I think, the community and the most exciting aspect, of that, it's not the way we want to go. It's not the way software went. Software at one point was, we're going to have these massive monolithic systems provided by one vendor, and we moved to a model in open source of smaller libraries which automatically were combined together in some way. And so this brings me to the question of machine integratability. And I want a challenging question to the audience here, which is the dream sometimes of linked data. Like this guy who drunk the Kool-Aid in Hampshire, a really nice guy, what he thought linked data meant to him was automatic integration. That's why he was kind of excited. He had this idea that, wow, I mark stuff up in this way and just magically I can ask questions like, you know, show me X spent on supplier Y at time dead and integrate it with this other data set over here. And, you know, it just all just magically would happen. And I think we've got to be very careful about that story because we want machine integratability. I mean, going back to my story, having a CSV file of like unemployment, I might want GDP. But think about software. There was a dream in software of automated integration software, that you design software systems by pulling color blocks together on a screen and they just integrate. And we have a lot of integration software, but it's still kind of hand glued. You still write code that you import library X and you glue it together with library Y and you read the API. We have very little automatic API discovery in integration software. It does happen, but it's relatively rare. It's relatively rare. And so I think we should think hard, like, you still want machine integratability, and having data in an ASCII text file with columns that are human readable is not going to cut on machine integratability. But you want to think about, do you mean automated machine integration, or do you mean facilitating machine integratability by having machine readability, by having it available in bulk, by using schemas that everyone understands? Or do you imagine automatic linking and, like, automatic resolution of complex queries? Because the second is very ambitious. And so I kind of, I have a feeling, my pitch is like to keep it simple. Like there so, there's so much to work on when you say where now, the where now for me is stuff like I want a transport planner across Europe, or I even just want to get data sets for train times across Europe in one common format. And the irony is, the one company that really made the running so far was Google, who had the financial time muscle to go around and lean on people in the US and say, we've got this format and you should adopt it, and if you do, we'll show up in, you'll show up in our route planner. 
And so I think, you know, keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. So there's a project we were running a bit with a bunch of other people called Data Protocols. There's the excellent work around a lot of linked data vocabularies. But we've got to keep them really simple. And we've got to really keep them driven by the problems they're seeking to address. Most web developers will not read anything longer than a page. I'll be really blunt. I looked at the payments ontology for the UK finances. I, I got lost. And I did mathematics at Cambridge. You know, I, I, I was lost. You know, and maybe that's just because finances are really complicated. But you know, like simple data format. I know I would have wrapped this is really it. But you know, I'm not saying this is the way, but you know, CSV based. Can we augment it with JSON LD with a little bit of stuff that can we also have a graded path? Can we have a way to adopt linked data gradually? Like you can use normal data JSON as your metadata schema and then enhance it with URIs if you want. That is why I'm so excited about JSON LD. 99.999% of web programmers in the world today, who are the people we need, who have the problems, and who will build the apps that average people will probably really care about, they consume JSON. They consume this simple stuff. We've got to give it to them in that way. It's the simple data format. It's like it's CSV and it's JSON, and it's basically you could export it from Excel. So micro schemas. So my one pitch to you today is can we have a kind of model around few, a few micro schemas on key topics? I've been on some calls in the US at the moment with the US CTO and a bunch of people, US citizens coming together and saying, whoa, we need some common formats for like garbage collection. Um, we need some common formats for describing transport timetables, other stuff, because then someone can build an app in Detroit and it can work in New York. We should have that here in Europe, but we need to do it from the bottom up in some sense, and it's got to be you know, I, it's like IETF, right? Rough consensus and running code, running code, running code. Actual application of stuff. And can we, what is the simple possible schema that we could have that would allow me to do transport timetables? And who can we lean on right now from some national transport infrastructure to give us some of that stuff? Or I don't mind if it's garbage collection or something, but really focus on small problems and schemas with no more than 10 columns in them. That's the rule. You know, we, could have a, we could have a rule. To make it into micro schemas, you're not allowed more than 10 columns. But really keep it simple, keep it cross country, keep it cross city. That's my one pitch to you from today. So to wrap up, open data is a platform and it's not a commodity. We want to build on it. We sell it. I'm telling the converted here, so I'm not going to go on about this one. There is increasing amounts of data. That is not our challenge. We need to be problem and application driven. I say this at the OKF now. We, we, there's still a lot of battles to be fought on the data, but we really need to not think about, I've got this data set or I've got this technology, how I apply it, and more like, I really want to have built this app. Because also we're now in a position where if we really want the data and we don't have it, we can probably lean on someone to get it, more likely now. Whereas before, we had to be, we beggars aren't choosers. If you don't have any choice over your data, you have to build with what you've got. Thank you. Exactly. I mean, it's a web 2.0. We also need brand people like branding. But then we, that's why my feeling is out of this. And I, I really owe this, by the way, to say to Max Ogden, to some extent, I should credit him here, who last summer at one point had a small data uh, hangout on IRC. And so I really, we should start spending the small data meme. Because it's not, it's, not about, it's not about that we want to be small. It's not about small is how we scale. You know, what worries me about big data as well is it's this kind of one ring to rule them all. You know, it's this kind of, and you know, you'll need big iron from big vendors to do big data. Um, you know, and I think the way, you know, the exciting thing for us is to be, at the moment, small, agile, and integratable. That's what we want to be doing, I think. But, sorry. Yeah, actually, small data is sometimes even more challenging because it's more heterogeneous in some ways. It's, uh, we had some project with historians. And they created a very relatively small data set. In the end, it was half a million triples. So it wouldn't even appear in the log cloud, and everybody would smile about it. But it was really a long time. They worked for four years, and they handcrafted all these things themselves. And I think it's very valuable for the historians to do research in the end. So I think size doesn't really. Size doesn't matter, as they say. We should. That's our tagline, right? Small data, size doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs>
but to find use for small subsections may be of more relevance to a particular sure. group. And as you say, the group may be only 30 people, but um, it's very useful to those 30 people. And just because they are small doesn't mean they should be excluded. Absolutely. And, and obviously, the big data set is out, it may be that uh, 5,000 little applications come from this big data set using 5,000 little subsections, overlapping subsections. Absolutely. Hi, um, I work for European for Eurology, which is the European Umbrella Organization for Geographic Information. It's an NGO we represent the industry and the user community. And actually I would like to have your view about the following. A lot of data is still also kept within research institutes and universities. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of their core business. What they do is they gather and produce data based or funded either nationally or even with European money. What happens a lot is that the sharing of these data is not always obvious because it's their for business. Uh, we have, um, for example, biodiversity data. There are a lot of observations that are kept all around Europe, all around the world, and they are not shared in data. And this is for personal interest. Uh, uh, interesting, for example, because if I go and live, I'm going to live in an area where the government says this was industrial terrain, but it has been cleaned up, everything is fine. I would like to see the biodiversity indicator. Are there bats? Are there anything that indicates it's still it's coming back to normal? So what is your view on these days that I have these little treasures within the research institutes? Because from their point of view, I think it's understandable sure. that they're core business. Because you are a big defender of open data.